So in terms of the amount of uh, maximum power that nuclear energy facilities can deliver at any given time, it's about roughly 2%. This number sort of varies. This is just the latest uh, snapshot. This is the last update that the uh, Central Electricity Authority had. But this sort of number changes a little bit. Uh, over the last 20 odd years that I've been following it, uh, it usually varies between 2 and 4%. Right? Sort of like the Hindu rate of growth, for those people who remember that. Right? So it's about 3%. That's kind of the capacity that it's been sitting at. And you know, if I had to bet money on this, you know, if I had to put a thousand rupees on it now, somebody would ask me, what do you think the share of electricity, nuclear electricity will be in 2030? I'd probably say it's going to be under 5%. You no, know, two to five, two to four percent, I'd probably give a thousand rupees on that. I can easily bet on that. Right? So it's the, the kind of thing which happens because uh, not because they don't want nuclear power, right? This is not a sign that the government is not interested. The government, the Indian government, like many other countries, including China and so on. Uh, and even the United States for that matter. Uh, they follow, they basically believe that, you know, we are going to require huge amounts of power in the future, and we have to invest in everything, what they call the all of the above strategy, right? So at the same time as they are building nuclear power plants, they're also building large dams, they're also building uh, windmills, they're also building solar fields, etc., 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 right? So all of these things are going to be going on at the same time. The question is how much can nuclear power grow in that thing? And so as a share of electricity, nuclear power is going to be small and sort of is likely to remain small. The uh, story has become particularly interesting in recent day, years because uh, a kind of a new source of power within courts uh, sort of started developing around a couple of decades ago and has sort of really caught on and that is sort of um, renewables. So if you see uh, solar and wind and so on, this is in terms of actual number of kilowatt hours generated to the grid, right? So this is not just in capacity. So the standard criticism against solar and wind is that they don't operate all the time, right? It's only when the sun is shining, when the wind is blowing, that we can generate electricity. But if you look at actual numbers, how much does the grid receive from the many solar uh, fields around the country, many rooftop installations, many windmills, and so on, that has become much larger. So the, uh, the greens used to be the nuclear, and you can see that, you know, wind has overtaken it around 2014, if you were to add both of them and you add the other sort of small dams and so on, <coughs> renewables sort of caught up with nuclear power and started exceeding it around 2011 or 2012, something like that. Right? Numbers are very big here, different ministries give different numbers, so I'm not going to give a very definite answer, this is from uh, sort of one particular source. Okay, so, so, this is, so back to the story um, of sort of the future and so on. Uh, so Nuclear power has never been a big part of the electricity share. If you were to just go by that, you know, people wouldn't be talking about it. You would not see stories written about it in nuclear. I mean, in the newspapers, you would not see, you know, Modi or uh, uh, Manmohan Singh sort of have long discussions with Obama or Hollande or whoever it is who's coming to the country talking specifically about nuclear reactor imports or anything like that, right? Because it's such a small source of power, you should just kind of let it be. But that's the problem. It's never been just that. It's always been, always been about the future. And so um, this is something which is, goes back to the very early days of nuclear power. So as I mentioned earlier, 1948 was when the Nuclear uh, Atomic Energy Commission was set up. And uh, you know, it sort of was given a lot of support and so on. Uh, the first time they started talking about these kind of future projections was in 1954. So by that time, there has been a bunch of people who started criticizing. You know, six years, early years, you know, they didn't realize that nuclear plants take so long to build and so on. So people are saying, okay, we've been giving all you money. What have you guys been doing? At that point, the, the Department of Atomic Energy had not constructed a single nuclear reactor. And uh, so at that point, they had this first big conference in November of 1954 when uh, Homi Bhabha, the uh, founder of the Indian nuclear program, he unveiled something called the three-phase strategy. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then he said, okay, you know, right now we don't have any nuclear power, but we have these great plants, right? And we're going to build huge numbers of nuclear plants. So by the year 1987, we'll have 8,000 megawatts, and by blah, 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 it'll be 25,000, et cetera, et cetera, 80, 87, sorry, uh, 8,000, 25,000. Uh, and he made these projections. Uh, and then, so as I mentioned, at that point, there was not even a single nuclear reactor in the country. So the first nuclear power plant that came and started generating electricity was in Tarapu, which started working in 1969. So around that time, the Atomic Energy Commission went through one of these big exercises and it produced its first one of these big plants. Uh, you know, how is it going to be by year 2000? 
and they said, you know, they made this, this curve here, which says 43,000 megawatts of power by the year 2000. And uh, a lot of it is through these so-called fast breather reactors, this little checked thing up there, right? I'll talk about that a little bit later. So actual capacity in 2000 was dead, right? So roughly about 5% of what they were projecting was what they got, 1800 megawatts, right? And this is kind of a story which repeats itself. I can go on and on and say, you know, in, in 1984 they said this, and this year they said that. But that's sort of, it'll just get very tiresome. It's the same story over and over again. Okay? Um, and so it's about 5%. So if you were to ask somebody in the nuclear establishment, why is this the case, they would immediately say, you know, in 1974, um, we tested a nuclear weapon, and, uh, you know, people stopped selling us nuclear reactors and other things. They would not use the word nuclear test, they would call it a peaceful nuclear explosion. Okay. Um, but that's a, yeah. no um, So, in, to some extent, this is true. The, the uh, program was still sufficiently new and quite dependent on imports. Though they would not want to say that because they want to always talk about indigenous development, and this uh, uh, culture of sort of emphasizing self sufficiency and so on. But nevertheless, it actually suffered to some extent. There are, you can see how specific projects, some, the, you know, one reactor was constructed before 1974, that took X number of years. The second adjoining reactor in Rajasthan took, you know, two times as long, right? That kind of stuff. You can see how drastically it affected them. At the same time, once that realization is set in, that didn't change their ambition. They kept making these long-term projections again, right? So the point, of course, is that you don't learn that you can't really do this thing so fast. Uh, so, one practical example was in 1984, they said, we're going to de generate 10,000 megawatts by 2000 using these, you know, this particular set of reactors that they had planned. So, one thing they should realize is that when they tried to build their first 235 megawatt uh, heavy water reactors, when they were making these projections in 1984, it had already taken way too long. They'd done things in Rajasthan and in Madras, and it was taking much too long, right? So, they didn't sort of... You know, and they, they had not built even two by that time, and suddenly they were talking about building 12 over the next 16 years. Okay? Then they were going to develop this new design for 500 megawatt reactors that they didn't have. So they were going to design a new set of reactors and construct nine of them by 2000. Right? So you, you can see where the story is going. So in 1999, the Comptroller and Auditor General, the uh, chief uh, you know, accounting body in the country or whatever, um, uh, auditing body in the country wrote, wrote a report where they basically said that this particular profile where they said 10,000 megawatts they delivered zero right uh, nil is what they actually do the term they used none of those reactors got constructed right eventually some of them got constructed much later and so on but by 2000 when their target was supposed to have met they had not constructed a single one of them right um, and they had sort of a huge number of reasons about why that happened so just to sort of cut the long short story short so there are some things which you can say about this repeated pattern of failures. The first is that every reactor that they have constructed has taken longer to construct and has cost more as a result. Right? Every reactor uh, so far. Uh, there is one little sleight of hand with Tara Core 3 and 4, but I will get to if anybody's interested in that detail, I can explain one on one. Um, and I think one of the important things that you learn when you look at individual reactors and why they were delayed is that every time there were problems that had not been envisioned when they started construction, right? You know, the first time around, you might say, okay, the first time you're ever building a reactor, you know, you don't know certain things, but why are you sort of making these mistakes again and again? And what you find is that, I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples. So the first set of reactors which were constructed of this heavy water reactor type, which were imported from uh, Canada, were in Rajasthan, right? And so that took its own time and so on. The Canadians helped with the first one, the second one was the one which was delayed because of the 1974 test. The next one which was being constructed was in Kalpakam, south of uh, Madras. And in Kalpakam, very different kind of area from, uh, from Rajasthan. So the, all these reactors require cooling water. Uh, and the cooling water for uh, Rajasthan came from the Rana Pratap Sagar, which is an artificial lake that was created there. In the case of Kalpakam, the water comes from the Bay of Bengal. And the Bay of Bengal has a certain particular pro, uh, uh, characteristic. It's called littoral drift in technical terms. This means that breaks up a lot of muck from the bottom of the ocean, right? And that kept clogging up all their pipes. So what they had to do was run pipes way down into the ocean before it, uh, before it sort of hits the coast, right? And that takes time, right? Next reactor that they built was in Narora. Narora is a different area. It's near the Ganges. 
right? No problem with pipes. Here the problem is that it's an earthquake prone area. So then you have to create a special uh, you know, basement or foundation for it, which is more seismic resistant, you put snubbers, things of that sort. So that takes a longer period. Okay? Then the next one they built is in a place called Kakrapar. Kakrapar is a different problem. The, water, the soil is too soft. It's sort of soggy, right? So then they have to build, fill it with all kinds of things, and still there was a flood in the 1990s. So this kind of, all these little niggly problems, not huge problems as it were. These are engineering problems, right? This requires sort of solid civil engineering and so on. And a careful assessment of how long it would take would suggest that you would have to spend a lot more time constructing reactors. But if you want to do that kind of careful assessment, then you can't make these grandiose projections, 10,000 megawatts by 2,000. Those are not compatible. Either you do it carefully or you do it grandiosely. Right? So that's, I think, one of the things. The second thing which you find is that in all those cases, they don't allot enough time to learn from earlier failures. Right? So you start constructing reactors of the same kind without really figuring out, OK, did my earlier uh, project function or not? How did it go, et cetera, et cetera. And this is something which is likely to happen with these so-called fast failure reactors which are happening. And the last thing which I would say is that there are sort of different kinds of designs that they are building. And the reactors are very complicated technologies. So trying to master one kind of reactor is hard enough. To try and import reactors from France, from the, U from the United States, from Russia, uh, your own reactors, your own breeders, it's not a good risk, right? Uh, you know, before you can get your sort of action going, you know, you're trying to do multiple different things. It's not, it's not a good, uh, it's not something which a good management consultant would uh, recommend. Then another part of the story, which is which becomes interesting, in since the 1980s, every reactor project, every uranium mine has faced public opposition. Right? Uh, it essentially starts with the story started with Narora, where there was a sort of small group of people, primarily from Delhi, who went and tried to. Uh, you know, raise awareness and so on. That was not very, uh, it was not very successful. Similarly, Kakrapad, there was sort of a um, sort of a hunger strike and various Gandhians were sort of done things. It was not a huge movement. Kaiga was the big changing uh, story. In This is a, story, a reactor in Uttar Kannada, probably the only reactors anywhere in the world in the middle of a tropical rainforest. Uh, and uh, so Kaiga sort of got a lot of environmentalists really upset, uh, quite justifiable. Uh, and it sort of led to a huge number of you know, grassroots level actions, lots of local taluks and I mean district headquarters and so on, passing uh, resolutions saying we are banning, we are we oppose this nuclear plant and so on and so forth. There was actually you know things which happened at the state level. Uh, there was the first time there was a case at the, uh, which went up to the Supreme Court, uh, and they actually won in a sense. But the case, the petition was kind of poorly worded. So both sides can sort of claim victory. That's another story for another time. There were a couple of uh, projects which were proposed in Kerala, in Bhutan, Leiter, and Perengom, which actually got cancelled as a result of public opposition. Uh, this was kind of a very, very unique thing. The only other place where this has happened is in West Bengal, in Goriko, uh, where a project was called and then then called off. Um, and then, you know, since then, you've seen in Kodangulam, you know, various uranium mining sites, etc., etc. And there are two aspects, I think, which are important. There may be other things which is not going to be focusing on that. Which are there are a set of concerns that people have about you know radiation, about the risk of accidents, you know after Fukushima, especially people are so particularly sensitized to it, uh, and this is kind of something which is true anyway, in a way, in many many different countries. Then there are sort of impacts on livelihood of people, right? There is competition for water, for land, uh, with sort of farmers, fisher folk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is something which is sort of seems to be intensifying. This is common to a lot of development projects, not just you need to nuclear power. Uh, but this is also something which is purely. And this is something which one would expect to see becoming more and more, in, more and more common and more and more difficult. And indeed, you know, trying to select new sites has been one of the major challenges that uh, the Department of Atomic Energy has uh, uh, has uh, uh, faced. In part, this is because trying to find a good reactor site is a very difficult proposition to start with. Uh, you have to have various geological characteristics. It should not be seismic. It should not be other things. You don't want it to be in a very highly populated zone in case there's an accident. You want to sort of you know, evacuate large numbers of people. At the same time, you also want there to be enough um, sources of demand 
So either some industry is there or some city is there so that you can evacuate the large amount of electricity which is being generated and being used without having to lay thousands of kilometers of cables to carry that. So there are see these sort of contradictions here. And what you find is that the first round of uh, site selections which the Department of Atomic Energy went through, they selected a bunch of sites, Tarapur and Kalpakam and Rajbata and so on. And some sites that they had actually said these are not suitable. They came later on and said, okay, we're going to do it anyway. Kakrapar is one of them. Uh, Jaitapur is another one, right? Way back in the 1990s, they talked about it. And today, more recently, uh, thanks to Rajendra here, I sort of learned today morning that there had been a, a committee report from uh, first from the Chakravarti committee way back in the 1970s and then more recently by VK Chaturvedi who used to be the head of nuclear power cooperation suggesting that not only is that area much more seismically active than we had known before, uh, there have been fault lines uh, where uh, there, there can be rupture uh, and uh, earthquakes much closer to the reactor site than, are, than is desirable. Okay? Uh, and more important, uh, you know, one of the arguments that was made because the site happened, was the, the official uh, confirmation of the site happened in 2011, as I mentioned earlier, just on April 2011. One of the concerns that everybody had, of course, was would there be a tsunami, right? And the argument that was made was in Jaitapur, we don't have to worry about tsunamis because it's going to be built way up high, right? That particular site is fairly high up. The problem is that what is that high up part is what's called laterite, this sort of holy thing. You cannot make reactors on top of that type. Reactors are very heavy. So you actually, what they will actually have to do if they go to build a constructed reactor there is to actually raise all that stuff and go back down, right? So the so-called advantage that Jaita Core posts is actually going to be a disadvantage because you have to excavate all this huge amount of muck from there, right? So, but what this is also indicated of what I was saying earlier, that for the nuclear establishment, it's going to be harder and harder to find new reactor sites. Which is why they talk about having these mega parks and you know having multiple reactors. And as you all know, if you have multiple reactors, as in Fukushima, when accident happens in one, it affects other ones. So it's not something which is desirable from a safety point of view. So there are going to be all these kind of very difficult constraints that's going to come up. Um, and also the other thing which I forgot to mention, which is a very important constraint for nuclear power plants, is that they require a big source of water because they, they have to be cooled all the time. So you have to be near the ocean or near a river and so on and so forth. And that's another way by which competition sort of comes up. All right, enough of that. Uh, so this is all history so far, right? So the next question to ask is, you know, I mean, those people who are inside the nuclear establishment know all this in a sense. They may not talk about it in public, but they do know much of this stuff. How do they actually ex expect to expand in this large 470,000 megawatts up from you know, 6,000 megawatts? And the answer is there are two solutions they talk about. They talk about some particular reactors called breeder reactors, and they talk about importing reactors from abroad. Okay. So I'll talk about each of them in time, or maybe for time. Um, so the let me talk about first uh, breeder reactors. Can you give me a signal about maybe 10 minutes before I'm sorry, uh, should be done? 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so um, breeder reactors are sort of a particular kind of reactor where uh, you fuel the reactor with something called plutonium, which is produced in, the, in all reactors. And in principle, if you design your reactor well, you can actually produce more plutonium than you put in. Right? So that looks like magic almost. Right? That somehow you're sort of you know, putting one bowl of rice and you're getting one and a half bowls of rice out of the, out of the microwave. Right? So it so seems very exciting. What's actually happening is sort of more subtle. In any uh, reactor, uh, it uses uranium, and there are two kinds of uranium, and one kind of uranium gets converted into the other kind of uh, into plutonium. That's how it happens. So if, what you're doing is actually using the uranium more efficiently in these breeder reactors. Be that as it may, breeder reactors are very attractive for to a large number of scientists and engineers. It just allows the idea of concept of you know breeders. This has been true the world over, and so around the time when this breeder reactors became part of the Indian nuclear sort of plans and promises. This was in 1954. Remember the conference that I mentioned where they made their first projections. That's when uh, Baba first talked about this three-phase program where he said the first phase we're going to have these so-called heavy water reactors and then we're going to have these breeder reactors and then eventually the breeder reactors will start using thorium to convert it into something called uranium-233 and we'll build this third phase of uranium-233 reactors. This is the same kind of plan the French had at the same time. Why? Because both Baba and French had the same problem. 
they both wanted to create these sort of uh, projections of large amounts of nuclear power in the future, but they wanted to do so with their available materials. So in the case of India, uh, and also in France, the problem was that the amount of uranium that was available, which was of good quality, which they knew about at that point, was fairly limited. So with that kind of limited amount of uranium, you could only build a, 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 a dozen reactors or so at that point. Right? And so then if you say, look, I'm going to do this, I'm going to build a large number of reactors, people ask you where you're going to get uranium from, you have to say, well, we have to import it. That doesn't sound so good in, in sort of post-colonial things and also in, in terms of, you know, when you talk about energy security and things like that. So the French answer was, was that we have Madagascar, Madagascar has a huge amount of thorium, we're going to use thorium. And that's the same thing which Baba was also talking about. That India has a large amount of thorium, we'll go use, up, use it. Now, this is actually sort of uh, peculiar in various ways, uh, but uh, the problem has been that what seems very attractive sort of from a physics point of view, in terms of producing more plutonium than you put in, when it actually comes to sort of generating energy and how much it costs to build these reactors, how well they operate, they operate pretty poorly. Right? It turns out that most countries which plan to do this spent in all about $100 billion around the world, but eventually gave up on that. Right? And so, you know, people, of course, there are people who are the people who believe in this. And so they'll say, okay, we've got it all wrong now, but in the future it's going to happen. But nevertheless, that's sort of something which has really died in most other countries. And so, you know, this was something which the, which the Department of Atomic Energy should have actually taken into account when it's making its plans, all right? But it doesn't, all right? And so even though in 1954, what seemed like a really good idea, uh, sort of like this, you know, story of uh, Winnie the Pooh, um, actually turns out to be not such a great idea, all right? But this is something which is interesting about the institutional culture of the Department of Atomic Energy. They cannot question what Baba has said. Right? At least as far as I can see, in public, I have not seen a single person from the Department of Atomic Energy coming out and saying, okay, this was a great idea then, we should give it up. Right? So once you say that, I think you're basically excommunicado out of power. I don't know what happens in there, but uh, you know, as you can imagine, I don't get to within a few miles of that place before they start sending out the guards. Uh, so anyway, so I'm not, I don't know what's going on inside there, but I can never see it in public happening, right? So there are sort of various problems with new uh, breeder reactors. I'm not going to sort of talk about it in any great detail. I'll just give you one sort of vignette to give you an example. That is the most profitable breeder reactor ever, right? That picture in the corner. This was a reactor which was constructed in Germany at the cost of about 3 billion marks or some, some absurdly high number like that uh, in the late 1980s. And then after Chernobyl, essentially, uh, the German sort of public changed quite dramatically. It was much more anti-nuclear and so on. So the local states, basically in Germany, said, we will not permit this reactor to start operating. So this is in a place called Kalkar, which is in the sort of near the border with the Netherlands. And so the, the Germans actually loaded the reactor with, no, they had not loaded the reactor with fuel there. It's just short of that, the last step. They basically called off the project, even though they built the whole reactor. And eventually it was sold to a Dutch businessman who converted it to an amusement park. <laughs> so it's the one which is making a lot of money as far as I can make up. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so I, as I said, you know, all these reactors which have been happening have been operating very poorly. In India, so there's one sort of little reactor called the fast breeder test reactor. It's operated pretty poorly. I'm not going to go through bore you with all the details, just take my word for it. Okay? Alright. Now, what I'm going to get to is a more, you know interesting in a nerdy sort of sense uh, <laughs> in the world, which is that, you know, so when you look at how these guys come up with these 470,000 megawatt kind of thing, there's a method to the madness, right? So the method to the madness is very simple. What they basically say is, look, breeder reactors produce more plutonium than you put in, all right? So, you know, I imagine that I start with, uh, you know, X amount of plutonium, then one year later that X is going to become X plus, uh, you know, 5% of X, 1.05 times X or whatever it is. And then I'll take that 5% away and I'll put, make it into another reactor and that's going to grow and that is going to produce more and more and more. Okay? So it's like, you know, how you teach uh, little children about savings banks and things like that. Compound interest, right? So basically that's the argument here. So you do that kind of methodology and uh, you will, you know, in sort of mathematical terms, what they have seemed to have done. And I, I tried to actually write to them. I even met one of the people who wrote the one of the papers which underlined that number, uh, that 470,000 megawatt number, 
called Grover, you know, very nice guy, but he never responded to me. So I don't know whether I'm missing. I had to sort of reconstruct it by what I think made sense from a physics maths point of view. So basically, they sort of written out a differential equation, solved it, and got an exponential, and that's what they fitted it to. That's my, my understanding. It turns out that actually this will not work in the Indian context. Uh, this is sort of, it's, it's an approximation which works in the US context because the US was a very different situation. They had 100 reactors operating at that point. They had huge amounts of plutonium already, or they could have expected to have huge amounts of plutonium. They would have never had a shortage. In the Indian context, actually, it takes much longer to construct this because you actually have to uh, produce, uh, you know, keep the plutonium for cooling for a while before you can process it, so you can make it into a new reactor and so on. There's a, there's a lag period, which they've completely uh, neglected as far as they could make out. And so that lag period of about three to five years, during that period for every reactor, you actually have to fuel it before it starts breeding, so to say, right? So in other words, if I put in a certain amount of fuel, it doesn't immediately come out as fuel the next month, the next year. You actually have to wait for about five years before you can take out that and sort of re-feed it into the reactor. So for those five years to operate the reactor, you have three to five years, you have to add new fuel, which you have to get plutonium from somewhere, it can't come from nowhere. So if you actually take that into account, what happens is that if their rate of growth is produced, then you will actually find that very soon you'll run out of plutonium, you'll become negative, right? I'm not expecting you to follow these calculations, right? This is kind of boring. But all I'm saying is that negative looks very good, which means it tells you something is deeply wrong here, right? And this is not a matter of trying to say whether it is, you know, optimistic or pessimistic. This is just the loss of physics, if you like, right? So this is how a reactor can operate, cannot operate any other way. You have to have plutonium to operate the reactor, and they will not have plutonium if they were to build reactors at the rate they are sort of talking about. Now, to me, it's, and the reason I share this is partly also to say that when these plans are being made, these large-scale projections are being made, it's not clear to me that there is any process of sort of review, critical peer review, that these people go through to say whether actually this makes sense or not. It's just something which is being produced. There is no review within the establishment, maybe because of the kind of institutional culture that they have. There is also no external government review process. And the, the CAG every now and then will write a report saying, you know, you guys have done really badly and so on. But clearly they have not sort of gone in and saying, look, your projections make no sense. Right? Stop making these projections. Right? And every time they can kind of go back and say, well, that was then, now is all new. We have learned our lessons from now on, everything is going to be new. That's, I think, the bottom line of this. Now, having said that, let me give you another quote. So, you know, if it's, this is, you know, for most of you remember Alice in Wonderland. And, you know, normally if you see these large projections, this is something which anybody, you know, with common sense would sort of say. You know, we have 5,000 megawatts of electricity. How are we going to get 470,000 megawatts by 2050 when between 1960 and now we only uh, build 5,000? And the answer is, you know, if you believe in it, you'll believe in it. Right? So, you know, you just have to get practiced believing in these kind of impossible things. Okay. Okay, all right. So I'm going to jump through this and saying let's not jump about all this. Let me actually go to another. So this is this is why the breeder idea is a bad idea, all right? That's the bottom line there. <laughs> Let me just jump now to the next one, which is what else can we do? What else can the government do? So for the last about uh, 10, uh, 11 years now, 2005, uh, when Manmohan Singh went to uh, Washington and he and George Bush signed this uh, agreement. From then on, there was a new alternative, which was we were going to import reactors, right? And so this is um, uh, the first set of imported, newly imported reactors, which is in Kodankula. Um, so this was from Russia. This is a little bit off the story. But nevertheless, uh, the, uh, uh, ever since the US-India nuclear deal, so what happened there was very simple. So as I mentioned in 1974, when India conducted its nuclear test, um, all other countries basically said, look, we don't like this idea of giving you giving countries nuclear reactors, and then they go off and making nuclear weapons. We don't like that idea. So we're going to form a little trade cartel, uh, which would basically say that only countries which have sworn not to develop nuclear weapons, sign the so-called nuclear non-proliferation treaty, will be allowed to import reactors. And India was not going to do that for reasons which are you know, a different story. Uh, and so India was not allowed to import reactors. Um, so between, for, for a long story short, the Bush administration did not agree with this position. Right? They basically said, we see the world, the, the people who, so the neocons who ran the uh, Bush administration then, they saw the world as good guys and bad guys. 
And so for them, the biggest bad guy was China. And so they looked around and said, okay, who is the person we can sort of prop up against China? And they saw India, and they said, okay, India is going to be on our side. It's a good guy, we're going to give them whatever they want. And the Indian foreign policy establishment had long said, we want to be able to import nuclear reactors. We said, sure, no problem, we'll give you. In exchange for which, the Indian nuclear establishment, the Indian government promised them, uh, so the US did the most of the hard work, diplomatic hard work, so they were promised two sites to set up reactors. The French did some work, so they were promised one site. The Russians were promised one site. So the two, two sites which were promised for the uh, United States were Mitiwardi in uh, Gujarat and Kovada in uh, Andhra Pradesh. For the French, it was uh, Jaitapur. And for the Russians, it was Koriku in, in, uh, in West Bengal. Uh, that's now probably going to move to uh, Andhra Pradesh, but that's a different story. Now, it turns out there is a reason, there's a problem here. The problem here is the problems with the Jaitapur site, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, but I won't uh, go back into that. The other problem is that these reactors are much more expensive. For better or for worse, uh, uh, reactors which are built in India, uh, because they have had a lot of experience with these heavy water reactors, because labor costs are lower here, et cetera, et cetera, they are much cheaper. Right? So if you were to sort of think about, a, a, you know, if we are going to build nuclear reactors, that would be the most sensible option. You built a large number of them, you know something about how to build them, so far, at least, you've not had an accident, so maybe that's the best choice, right? But that's not what, that will not get you to those 470,000 megawatt ranges, so you need to do something else. So then they are going, thinking about importing these reactors, but these are much more expensive, right? So typically, if you look at the kind of cost that you're talking about, the, uh, we calculated that depending on what you, so the answer they would, the nuclear establishment would give is, yes, imported reactors cost a lot of money, because in the West, we know it costs a lot of money, but they're going to be made in India, right? Make in India is the slogan, of course, right? So you make it, make everything is going to be made in India. We're going to lower costs uh, enormously. There are problems with that story, which I, I can come into later in the Q and A. But the fact is, according to themselves, their own uh, estimates, they can lower costs by something like 25 to 40 percent by doing things in India as opposed to doing things abroad, right? So if you look at what the costs abroad are, they are typically of order of six thousand to seven thousand dollars per kilowatt, for each uh, kilowatt of electricity capacity, right? So even the median number that you can expect in India, according to their optimistic, is about 4,000. At that median number, the the tariff, the amount of, you would have to charge for the electricity in order to just break even, so to cover all your costs, would be something like 15 up to 20 odd rupees, depending on what you assume to your assumptions. Much higher than what you pay. Today, the newest set of solar um, uh, reverse auctions have been producing numbers of the order of four rupees fifty paise to five rupees, typically. Right? Um, coal and natural gas would be probably coal, sorry, not natural gas would probably be even cheaper. Uh, so you know, this is much higher than what you're saying. Again, let me come back and the, whether they're going to go ahead with this or not is an open question. But you can see some resemblance here to the story of Enron, right? which was that Enron was supposed to do exactly what these imported reactors were going to do. They were going to catalyze a whole amount of sort of independent power plants based on naphtha or natural gas and things of that sort. In the end, what happened was Enron was a one-off by effect, essentially. Right? No, no more of those kind of plants were constructed. Right? Likewise, coming back to the question that we started with, what is the likelihood of, sort of India being able to ex expand nuclear power so gradually, the lesson of these kind of cost calculation would be that, well, maybe you can build one or two reactors, subsidize it, and so on. It cannot be the recipe for a large scale expansion. All right. Let me just finish with one you know, side thing, which is sort of something which has come up a lot in recent years. So the, the US-India nuclear deal sort of ended with the nuclear supplies with the trade cartel that I mentioned, allowing India to import reactors. That's when the talk about reactors started, right? Importing reactors started. This was in 2008. And at that time, um, uh, the nuclear establishment had predicted that by 2014, the first of these imported reactors would start generating electricity. Now, of course, we are in 2016, not even the construction of a new reactor has started at this point. Right? So what, again, they would have a story for this. The story for this here goes to uh, this notion of the nuclear liability. Right? What, is, what is the story here? And because this is something which comes up in the news, I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes talking about that. Which is that um, nuclear reactors are different in that uh, they're capable of fairly catastrophic accidents. Now, 
in the United States, where nuclear power plants were first sort of commercially built and so on and so forth, many countries built it, but in the United States it was different in that the entire power sector, the electricity industry, was largely private. Whereas in other countries it was government owned. So in the private sector there was a special problem, which is that these power plant owners or the owners to be were concerned if there's an accident they would be sued by people who are suffering from health or from property damage or something of that sort. And the numbers that would were quoted were quite high. So most of these companies realized that they would go bankrupt if even one of these accidents happened. So they said, look, we don't want to build any of these things. So what the government in the United States did was they passed something called the Price-Anderson Act, which basically capped the amount of liability that individual companies would have. Right? The next problem came when the US uh, started thinking about exporting nuclear power plants. And this was to Western Europe first. So the uh, vendors in the United States got together uh, and uh, they had a meeting in Harvard and they basically said, look, we don't want to take on this liability. What if we export a reactor to West Germany or to France? There's an accident there. Those guys will start suing us. We don't want to deal with all this. So what can we do? So they basically said, if you're going to import one of our reactors, you have to indemnify us. You can examine your reactor all that you want, but the moment you get it, it's yours. If anything happens, you take care of it. All right? uh, so, you know, in some cases that is that makes sense. In other cases, it doesn't make sense. So, for example, you know, a few years ago, if you remember, there was a problem with Toyota cars. There was something called the stuck pedal problem. That you know, the gas pedal would sort of stay down and people would speed up, and you know, there would be accidents. Likewise, GM had a problem with its uh, key. Uh, if it was weighed, then suddenly would, the power would cut off. In these kind of circumstances, the typical way by which the legal system deals with it is saying, look, if this is not the fault of the individual driver, and if it's the individual driver's fault, then it makes sense that he or she was driving rashly or something, he or she has to pay for the damage. But if this is a system-wide problem, all cars seem to have it, then the government, the, the company has to take responsibility for it. In the nuclear case, that's not true, right? So what this uh, indemnification does is basically saying the vendor, once he's, he or she sells it, is completely off the hook. Okay, and the problem is that there are, there's um, the liability that is uh, placed for operators is uh, is a very small amount. Okay, I'm not going to go into the numbers, but it's just take my word for it. It's a fairly small amount in comparison to two different quantities. The first quantity, which most people will think is obvious, is what is the cost of dealing with an accident. So, Fukushima estimates of how much it's going to cost with it, uh, deal with it, are between 100 and 200 billion dollars, right? So 133 billion, I think, is the latest number that I've seen, but this is something that's growing over a period of time. The amount of liability that's uh, placed upon uh, on an operator, how much is going to be given uh, in the Indian context, if I'm not mistaken, for the operator's 1,500 crores, the government pays 2,500 crores, which is roughly about 300 to 500 million dollars. I don't remember what the current, I'm not going to do the math in my head. Um, but it's a fairly small number compared to the cost of an accident. So that part is obvious. So it, you know, for the um, uh, it, it seems to be a clear problem there. But the second problem is more interesting, which is compare this with the cost of a reactor. Okay? The cost of a reactor is typically about ten billion dollars, give or take a few billion dollars. So that is again about twenty times the cost of your liability. Okay? Now this. Uh, if you are a reactor vendor, all right. Uh, okay, let me actually sorry. Let me just come back to that in one second. I think the story will be more interesting in the case of India. So, what happened in the case of India? And I'll, I'll come back to that in a bit. Which is that um, in India, when this this uh, once the U.S. India nuclear deal went through, the Parliament had to enact a law, which basically uh, indemnified all vendors before they would agree to export reactors to India. Right? This is especially true of the United States <coughs> reactor vendors because they were private companies. In France and Russia, the, the companies which are selling are government companies, so they don't care that much. Right? But these US companies were saying, you have to pass this registration before we do anything. Registration comes to parliament, history of Bhopal sort of kicks in, and they basically say, no, this is not okay, we can't sort of do this. And the long and short story of it is that in the end, there is a small amount of liability that flows back to the vendor in the Indian Act, okay? which basically says that if there's an accident, then NPCIL, which is the operator of all the plants, nuclear power corporation, would go out and pay compensation to people, and then it can go 
back to Westinghouse or whoever it is sourcing and say if this, if you can trace the accident to a problem with the reactor design, you can go back and claim compensation from them. That's the this thing. So, uh, basically, the, uh, the reactor vendor said, no way, you are not going to do this. 50 years, we've sort of had this uh, regime. Why are you coming and changing all this and blah, blah, blah. And everybody, every state department official will come and give long lectures on why this is not okay and blah, blah, blah. Right? But here comes the interesting question. So if the, even that small amount of liability flows back, right? a reactor vendor is selling you something for about $10 billion, and in exchange for which they might have a maximum uh, liability of $300 million. Okay? Now, if you as a reactor vendor do find a problem, a safety problem, small with leads to a small chance of an accident, what are, you, what are your financial incentives? Are you going to spend you know, a few half a billion dollars sort of repairing that? Or are you going to take the chance that there's a small chance there might be an accident, and then there's a small chance, even smaller chances that liability will flow back to me, and I might have to pay something. So this is not to say that they're all mean guys and they're sort of planning to you know, blow up the world and blah, blah, blah. But the financial incentive structure is just all pulled down. So what they call moral hazard in this, in this sort of terms. That the, you are insulating a party from the risk and therefore they can sort of change what they do. And the other thing which is interesting here is that one of the problems which, uh, you know, in all these reactor sites, as I mentioned, there is opposition. And the claim that you see here, especially after Fukushima, is that all these reactor vendors will immediately tell you, oh, don't worry about that. Don't worry about accidents because our reactors are very safe. And they go through this crazy procedure which is called probabilis probabilistic risk assessment. And they'll produce some absurdly small number. They'll say, the probability of an accident at one of our nuclear reactors is 1 in 100 million years or something. You know, 8.4 into 10 to the minus 9. Some absurdly small number like that. Which actually makes no sense if you look at the calculation, but that's a different story. What is interesting here is that that small number, if you took that number and you multiplied it by this liability, you will see what is the mean sort of insurance you would have to take in order to account for the liability. Because when you multiply even a few hundred million dollars by that small number, you're going to end up with a very small premium that you have to pay for insurance, if those numbers are to be taken seriously. Right? So in principle, the, the, any of these companies should say, no problem, you know, we'll just create a little fake insurance company, we'll insure ourselves and then go ahead and do this because the probability that that's going to happen is so small, it's only free money, essentially. The premium is going to be free money, right? But that's not the way they think. They, either they don't trust their own numbers, their own calculations, or they don't trust that somehow this insure, this liability will be capped at this amount. Then maybe the country might come back to you and say, give us $20 billion or $50 billion or whatever it costs. Which is what happened in the United States, if you remember. So when the BP oil spill happened, BP has a similar liability cap. But Obama basically said, look, this is how much it's going to cost you. You pay up, this is the cost of doing business with the United States. And BP paid up. Because they see the US market is still very profitable. The question is, does the same thing apply to India? And here you can look at the example of, let's say, Ecuador, where Chevron had a similar sort of uh, liability there because of all the oil spills there. Ecuador claimed they won in the court. Equ uh, the Chevron just said, no, screw you, not, I'm not going to pay. Right? Can Ecuador's government really sort of go after Chevron? Do they have the political power to do that? Which end is India going to be in? We don't know. Okay. Um, so to sort of come back to the bottom line, uh, you know, will India meet uh, its uh, ambitious nuclear power goals? Answers, answers no, obviously. I think there are a lot of reasons why it's going to happen. In terms of the specific strategies that they have talked about, there's this reliance on a very failed technology called breeder reactors. And I think that's a huge problem uh, in terms of their own plan. Assuming, assuming that we think it's a good idea, right? All that. The second is these kind of importing nuclear expensive reactors from abroad are hitting roadblocks of different kinds, liabilities, you know, cost is too high, things of that sort. And lastly, I think you know these plans are being made with absolutely no lessons learned from history, either Indian or global. So I'll uh, never mind that, never mind all that. Okay. I'm already out of time, all right? So I will just end with this little line for you to see. But of course, in the in the case of the nuclear establishment, they are not going to sort of they they see things slightly differently. Thank you.